speaker uh, discussed uh, trying to get a construct. Uh, so perhaps uh, you have a plan that uh, is above and beyond the cut, cap, and balance act uh, that we might see that uh, uh, would be a balance plan that uh, would help us. I, uh, if the gentleman wants me to yield, I'll yield. No? I yield back the balance of my time. Will the gentleman yield back? Mr. Speaker. General for Virginia is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that when the House adjourns today, it adjourn to meet on Monday next when it shall convene at noon for morning hour debate and 2 p.m. for legislative business. Without objection, so ordered. The chair will now entertain requests for one-minute speeches. For what purpose does the gentleman from Illinois arise? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we're talking about debts and deficits uh, financially, I'm here to talk about a freedom debt and a freedom deficit that's occurring in parts around the world, one that I've been focused on a lot is the country of Belarus, the last dictatorship in Europe. The political and economic and human rights situation in Belarus has significantly deteriorated. A total of 33 opposition leaders and activists are still being held in prison for peacefully protesting against the dictatorial regime and falsified 2010 presidential election. Silent protests have sprung up on an online campaign called Revolution Through Social Networks, which encourages people to come to their localities, central squares, every Wednesday to express discontent with the Lukashenko regime. Opposition activists, journalists, and ordinary people have and continue to be arrested. The authorities have also launched a distributed denial of service attacks on opposition websites. The United States and the European Union continue to condemn these activities. We must think strategically about Belarus post Lukashenko when the people of Belarus are finally able to establish a democratic society based upon the principles of a free market economy. In anticipation of that day, each and every one should prepare now so as to be in a position to rapidly assist in the establishment of internationally recognized elections and rules-based transparent governments in Belarus. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purposes does the gentleman from Georgia arise? The gentleman is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today, thanks to the courageous reporting of two journalists for Al Jazeera's English network, Callum McRae and John D. McHugh, who risked their lives to find the truth, we have shocking evidence of war crimes committed by the Sudanese armed forces against Nuba civilians in Sudan's South Kordofan province. Here in this photo, a two-year-old victim of an airstrike. And here is a bomb crater uh, in the middle of this Nuba village. 50 50 feet wide, 15 feet deep. And here, Mr. Uh, uh, Chairman, uh, satellite imagery analyzed by Harvard University's Humanitarian Initiative reveals evidence of mass graves outside South Kordofan's capital of Kadolgi. At this moment, Mr. Speaker, as the UN personnel hide behind their barracks walls, the SAF are hunting men, women, and children on foot in fighter jets and with bombs rolled out of back doors of cargo aircraft in Nuba villages. Where does the United Nations stand as the Nuba are wiped out? Where do we stand? I yield the balance of my time. Yields back. The chair now lays before the House the following request for leave of absence and such leaves without any objection being noted are granted. Leave of absence requested for Mr. Burton of Indiana for today, Mr. Coble of North Carolina for today afternoon, and Mr. Ellison of Minnesota for today. And without objection, those leaves are granted. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardozo, is now recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. The gentleman is recognized for 60 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. So ordered. I want to thank my good friend for yielding this time to me. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
I rise today to honor and remember a great American, Mrs. Linda Lopez, a treasured member of my staff who passed away over the Fourth of July weekend. It's somewhat appropriate that that was the weekend that she passed away since she was such an honorable and patriotic lady. Her services will be held today in our hometown that we shared. Linda was not only a dedicated constituent services representative, she was a tireless advocate and community leader in Merced, California. Born in New Mexico, Linda moved to California's Central Valley in 1955, where she attended public school in Madera and then later attended Stanford University. For the past 40 years, she was involved in civil rights and social justice work and was considered one of the most influential Latina Americans in the Central Valley. Linda's community leadership included serving on the City of Merced's Redevelopment Agency Gateway Projects Citizens Advisory Committee, the City of Merced's Planning Commission, and several City of Merced ad hoc committees. She also served on the San Joaquin Valley Partnership Telecommunications Committee and the California State Advisory Board for Transportation, Planning, and Environmental Justice. Linda Lopez was also an alumni of the Great Valley Center's ideal inaugural class, Hispanics Organized for Political Equality and Leadership Merced. Not surprising, giving her devotion to her community, Linda was named the 1998-99 Hispanic Woman of the Year by the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Linda joined my Merced District staff in 2006 as a constituent services representative, acting as my eyes and ears in the community. She worked on thousands of cases and helped thousands of people. She never let go of a case she believed needed work and was meritorious. Linda prided herself on giving 100% to everyone who walked in the office, regardless of their political uh, party, the color of their skin, what they believed or didn't believe. She believed everybody deserved to be treated well. It was not unusual at all for Linda to work late nights and on weekends to make home visits to elderly constituents needing assistance or to follow up with a phone call long after she had done her best to resolve the case. The hallmark of Linda's work was her unbelievable compassion and she was appreciated not just by the people she helped by, but by her community as a whole. Linda's passion for making a difference set her apart from many others. She offered a kind smile and a compassionate ear to everyone she came in contact with. Often Linda's relationship with other community members evolved into a mentorship programs and as her legacy she asked that there be established a leadership scholarship in her name. Linda guided many other aspiring community activists in her passion and her efforts to serve others. In addition to her role as a public servant, Linda was a wife and a mother, and her beautiful family will miss her dearly. Linda Lopez made Merced, California a better place to live, work, and raise a family. Mr. Speaker, I am very proud today to call her a member of Team Cardoza, and even more proud to call her a friend. Mr. Speaker, thank you for this opportunity to honor this great America, Linda Lopez, for her work, for her tireless efforts on behalf of our community, and for her work on behalf of our, com our country. I'd like to now yield to my good friend, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for the remaining of my hour. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for the remainder of the hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I was overcome 
with disbelief to hear my Republican colleagues, the same colleagues who are leading America head first into its first default of its obligations, call on President Obama to start picking and choosing who wins when we run out of money. Now, pay our seniors first, Mr. President. When we force a default, pay our bondholders first, Mr. President. Pay our soldiers first, Mr. President. The GOP is shockingly silent, however, remarkably quiet when it comes to naming who the Treasury should stop paying when they force us into a default. Now, in case you weren't aware, let me clue you in on the definition of a default. It means the inability, the failure to meet our financial obligations. And we have many financial obligations we cannot afford thanks to the possibility of this default that our friends on the other side of the aisle are leading us toward. This is a crisis that they manufactured. Two wars unpaid for, tax cuts for millionaires that were unpaid for, policies that ignited a fiscal crisis and sunk us into a sea of red ink. Now, their refusal to accept responsibility for this debt that they created means that someone who the Treasury owes money to will not get paid. Someone will not get paid. And the full faith and credit of the United States of America will be broken. Now, they're playing a game with our economy to try to force through an extremist agenda. That's what we've been battling against. That's what you've been watching. That's what people all around the country are so incredibly frustrated with. It's a game that I have right beside me. It is, in fact, the GOP wheel of misfortune. Except in this game, there are no winners. There are only losers. But why don't we give it a spin? As we approach the defaults and we spin the wheel, the first one that comes up I see is, is 2 million federal workers. Come August 2nd, the GOP defaults forces the Treasury to send every federal employee home without a paycheck. From the personal care attendant who works for the Department of Veterans Affairs to the park rangers who lead families through our national parks, a GOP default will send 2 million American workers home without pay. During this time of high unemployment, our economy will suffer even more with the ripple effects of suspending pay for 2 million American workers and their families. So pay the federal workers, we might be told. Let's figure out who else we might choose not to pay. What other obligations of the federal government will be broken? What will we choose to avoid if there's a default? Well, if we go back to the wheel, we spin the wheel again, we see foreign creditors. Come August 2nd, the GOP forced default will force the Treasury to stop paying interest to our foreign creditors who currently buy U.S. credit with total confidence. When you default on a credit card, everyone knows this, when you default on a credit card, you don't save money. Your interest rates go up. The bank lowers your credit rating. And if the U.S. stops paying its creditors, then the U.S. credit will be downgraded, interest rates will skyrocket, and our economy will freeze, and the damage amount to a tax increase on every American family will be thanks to the Republican majority that will force this default. But perhaps we should pay the credit holders. Maybe that's who we should pay. Clearly there is someone else that we will not then. So let's go back to the wheel. When we spin the wheel this time, we get to bondholders. Well, come August 2nd again, someone won't get paid. The GOP default will force the Treasury to deny U.S. bondholders the money that they entrusted to our nation. The college student 
cashing in a bond their parents bought on their first birthday. The retirees, the retirees who steer their 401ks to the most secure, safest investments in the world, at least until the Republican majority forced a default. But perhaps we'll pay the bondholders. We've been told we can pick and choose who we're going to pay when there is a default. Then we should find out perhaps who we might see next. If you spin the wheel again, it might turn out that we come up on Medicare. Now, on August 2nd, again, the GOP default will force the Treasury to stop paying for the trusted Medicare benefits that 54 million seniors rely upon. Perhaps my friends on the other side of the aisle may finally have their opportunity to dismantle the system that keeps so many retirees from bankruptcy due to private insurance bills. The doctors who treat our Medicare patients from the primary care physician who takes seniors' blood pressure during yearly checkups to the oncologist who treats our grandmothers and grandfathers when they struggle with cancer won't get paid as a result of this default. But again, we've been told that we can simply pick and choose, that perhaps it's important for us to make sure that Medicare benefits are paid. What to do? We can go back to the wheel. We can spin the wheel again. It may turn up on veterans. Perhaps we've made a decision to make these other payments, but it comes up on veterans. So again, on August 2nd, if we do not come to an agreement, which is completely doable, if we do not avoid this GOP cause default, then the Treasury may stop caring for our veterans. Representing Florida's 19th district, I am privileged to serve thousands of veterans, many of them veterans of World War II, members of our greatest generation, the very people who built this nation into what it is today. Now, Americans believe that we have to honor the sacrifices of those who serve. But by forcing America into default, the GOP will deny care to the men and women who embody patriotism and deserve every benefit that they earned while serving this country. This game, this unfortunate game that they wish to play, could go on and on and on. Maybe we choose to pay our veterans, but we stop paying our troops. Maybe we will, as the President pointed out, we will have no choice but to stop paying Social Security in the event of default. Come August 2nd, the potential of a GOP default would force the Treasury to deny seniors the Social Security benefits that they earned over a lifetime. In my district and around the country, going without Social Security for any period of time will mean destitution and extreme financial hardship. The Republicans have long fed the American people the lie that the bonds held by Social Security are junk. Well, they've never been junk, at least so long as America has never defaulted on its obligations. This is the wheel of misfortune that we have to avoid getting to. It's not a game anyone wants to play. This hardship thrust upon the American people in the event of a default is completely avoidable. The GOP could make history, make history by working with President Obama to reduce the deficit in a meaningful, in a responsible, and in a fair way. Instead, Republicans seem hell-bent on making history by tarnishing the full faith and credit of the United States of America for the very first time. The reason they won't come to the table, the reason that we may be forced to spin the wheel of misfortune, preserving tax cuts for millionaires, preserving tax breaks for corporate jets, preserving tax loopholes and payments to oil companies. They seem more intent on subjecting the American people 
to the wheel of misfortune than standing up to the special interests that Americans want us to stand up to in the name of fiscal responsibility and fairness. In this game of partisan politics, a game that people all around the country are tiring of, no one wins, and the American people, unfortunately, always lose out. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would be delighted to yield uh, to the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for the remainder of the hour. Let me um, thank the gentleman from Florida. He is. Uh, let me thank the gentleman from Florida. He has certainly uh, awakened a number of issues and members uh, on his important discussion. And. I wanted to join in his commentary about this very important discussion. Mr. Speaker, we will be leaving shortly, uh, and I'm glad that we will be returning on Monday for very serious business. Many of us have been in meetings today uh, engaging on solutions uh, rather than distractions as it relates to the business of the American people. None of us have experienced, I believe, the attention uh, to an issue of the budget as much as we've had that attention now from our constituents on will the debt ceiling be raised. It's not a time in these past couple of weeks that I've gone home when business persons, students, seniors, working families have not asked the question, Will we get it done? I'm an optimist, and I've said to them, yes, I expect that. In fact, I've already gotten it done. I voted on the clean debt ceiling raise or lift so many weeks ago. That was the right thing to do. And the reason is because over the last couple of decades, uh, we have had 60 plus increases in the debt ceiling, starting from Ronald Reagan, including Bush 1 and Bush 2, President Clinton, President Carter. And it's interesting that for some reason the tension in this discussion has really gone beyond understanding. Now let me be very clear. I am looking forward. We have had uh, such an intense couple of months that we have not had the opportunity really to engage as members of Congress. Our committees have been fairly tense and rapid. Our schedules have been such that we've been here one week and gone the next. And I know that there are new members of the 87 members of the Republican conference that I would have some things to agree with. And I would uh, appreciate having that opportunity. But this is a time now without the opportunity to get to know all of the members of the Republican Conference who are new, that we have to get to know each other around solving America's problem. As I indicated, when a clean debt ceiling was put on the floor of the House, many Democrats voted for it. The bipartisan Simpson-Bowles Committee, Democrats and Republicans were on that committee. At one point in the discussion with President Obama, the leadership of the Republican House agreed to do the larger package of $4 trillion as it relates to the debt ceiling revenues and cuts. Makes sense, doesn't it? That's what a household does. They look at where they can bring down their budget, but they also say, now, what can we do to increase that revenue? People who are unemployed want to increase revenue by getting a job. And so I don't fully comprehend why it is such a complicated process to participate in. What makes it difficult is we have 
leadership in the other body that is Republican that says their main job is to defeat President Barack Obama in 2012. I didn't hear that discussion during my fellow Texans' tenure as president, George Bush, uh, from Democrats. There were policies that we disagreed with, including the Iraq War. But there was no concentrated, continuous effort and statements. My main job here is to bring down President Bush. That was not the language that we used. So how do we get the leader of the minority in the Senate suggesting his main job is to bring down the President of the United States. That's what Mr. and Mrs. Jones, mom and pop, all over America don't understand. They don't understand it. Because we all take a pledge of oath, we all have the same Constitution in our hands, and we know that this body of lawmakers is looked upon as the most powerful lawmaking body in the world. Oh, we don't walk around with a lot of big shoulders, but that is how we're perceived. I happen to have been at the European Union discussing the conditions in Greece and Portugal. They are far different from that in the United States. First of all, economists will tell us this country is not broke. It has the ability to fix itself. Let us not cast out despair and desperation and frustration to the American people. We are Americans, not arrogant, but we're patriots. We can get this done. Why is there such a devastating attitude from my friends on the other side of the aisle? It is the end of the world, the death knell. And so those people who are looking forward to job creation and jobs are listening to this rancor, this discourse, and, telling, and saying to themselves, there is no hope. There is no hope. And I disagree with that. There has to be hope for the children of this country. There has to be hope for the young men and women that are on the front lines of Iraq and Afghanistan and places around the world. There has to be hope. And the reason why I know that there is hope is because my own industry, the energy industry, just created a program for veterans to jobs through the industry and energy industry. I'm asking them to create one for 18 to 35-year-olds. Businesses are still alive and well. The financial services or the banking entity must be involved in providing access to credit for our smaller businesses who are creating jobs, but we are alive and well. And so I believe what we should do is to go forward with a package that is reasonable, that lifts the debt ceiling as we did for everyone else. I would vote for a clean debt ceiling, lift it up, and then begin to with great sense, common sense, plan our budget and our cuts. Mark Zandi has said that. An economist that's worked for a number of Republicans, such as uh, John McCain, former presidential candidate. Why are we trying to reinvent the wheel? All economists will say you don't make immediate cuts in this fiscal year. You project them out, just like budget and households. They move out. They do what they're going to do for the month of June, and then for the month of July, and then for the month of August. But no, I am particularly sensitive to the fact that only this president, only this one, only this one has received the kind of attacks and disagreements and inability to work. Only this one. Read between the lines. What is different about this president? that should put him in a position that he should not receive the same kind of respectful treatment of when it is necessary to raise the debt limit in order to pay our bills, something required by both statute and the 14th Amendment, why isn't it addressed in the manner? It's all right to disagree or agree on the balanced budget amendment. It's all right to talk about how we're going to appropriate. In fact, in this House, the Republicans are getting their way, gutting and cutting everything that we can find. It's all right to have that disagreement. That is the give and take of democracy. When you win, you're the majority. And if we can't find a way to uh, agree together, then the majority wins. I understand that. But I do not understand what I think is the maligning and maliciousness of this president. Why is he different? And in my community, that is the question that we raise. In the minority community, that is the question that is being raised. Why is this president being treated 
so disrespectfully. Why has the debt limit been raised 60 times? Why does the leader of the Senate continually talk about his job is to bring the president down to make sure he's unelected? It's 2011. It's not 2012. You need to play those politics in 2012, not now. And so we can move forward. You may disagree with me. I believe it's important to preserve Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security lifelines for our community. And many of us believe that that will not dash the hopes and dreams of Americans to make sure that seniors and the disabled and uh, those who retired and those who uh, need these resources, children who need Medicaid, it's not unseemly to protect them in the course of our discussion on budget cuts. It's not unseemly to protect military families. It's not unseemly to be able to provide increase in salaries for the young uh, if you will, enlisted man or woman who in some occasions have been on food stamps. And so I'm prepared uh, to do the hard things that we have done in 1997 when we had a budget resolution crafted by a uh, divided uh, government, if you will, and we produced a children's health insurance program and a balanced budget without a balanced budget amendment. And there were some fixes that we are still living with, such as the physician reimbursement that came about. As you do, as, as what happens when you do that, something has to be fixed. We're still suffering with the physician reimbursement, which came about through the 1997 balanced budget. So balancing the budget and a balanced budget amendment is not, no, all peach, is not all peaches and cream. It can truly be destructive. But I am willing in the long range, with common sense coming from Texas, to look seriously at how we can work together for cuts but revenue enhancers. I just had a meeting with industry representatives this morning that one of the industries that happens to be in the eye of the storm and there was a consensus saying we're prepared to look broadly at tax reform. We'd like to give our ideas. I said you deserve to give your ideas and as you deserve to let everyone know that we're in the business of creating jobs. But we cannot do this in the background of the hostility of the inappropriate treatment and behavior around President Barack Obama. So what are we prepared to support? I believe, again, that we can come together around a reasoned response. And that reasoned response, again, are revenues and cuts. And I believe that we can move this before August 2nd, we only have to be able to convince the new members and the leadership, the point man for the Republicans, that it is better to stand as a whole nation than to bring us down. There are those who believe this is what will happen before August 2nd. And frankly, it is a challenge. We have already lost $150 billion right now. Our colleagues need to know that. By all of this fooling around, we're losing in the markets $150 to $200 billion. You want to know where the unemployment came from? We've been creating jobs in the private sector, but it's our states that have been laying off hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of thousands upon thousands of public workers, firefighters, police, sanitation, teachers, that we'll never get back for our children. When they enter the fall classes, 35, 40, maybe 50 will be in a class. What kind of America art is this? And what kind of an America would lay off the public sector employees, which, by the way, were the doors, were the opportunities that opened to minority Americans? Large numbers of minorities were public sector employees. You are literally killing our community with the high number of unemployment. We're a double digit in the African-American community. But I frankly believe as an American, I should look out for all interests. And that's why I believe we should stop the tomfoolery and come together as Americans. And yes, I, have to, I will have to make sacrifices. We've laid out our parameters, mine, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. But what can we do together? And what can we do where the pain is distributed and what can we do with the respect given to everyone, speaker, 
majority leader, minority leader, whip, leadership in the other body, how can we come as those entities respect the bodies that they represent and we who are members of Congress represent our constituents in that respectful manner and most of all respect the office of presidency and as well to respect this president, President Barack Obama. I hope someone will say that what it appears to be is not in fact accurate, but historically it seems to be nothing more. And I simply close in accounting for that attitude is the very visible debate and in my memory of the Affordable Care Act. And I have never seen the level of depicting of a President of the United States by Americans as I had seen during that debate. Never seen it. I did not adhere to the burning and effigy of any President during the Iraq War. At that point it was President Bush, the shoe throwing, I spoke vigorously against that. You do not disrespect our president. You disagree or you agree, but not in the way that I have seen. I simply close uh, this afternoon by saying that it gives me a great sense of affection. I'd say pride for a lack of a better word, in what this country stands for. I believe that America can solve any problem that she puts her mind to. The tumultuous 60s is part of my history. A segregated America is part of my history. And during that time, one felt, could we ever come through this? The bloodshed, the hanging, the brutality. But isn't it wonderful that a man by the name of Martin King rose along with others, too many to name, and carried the mantle of peace, the drum major for peace. And he came through all of the contentiousness and all of the conflict and raised his voice and said America can do better. And a president who I'm most proud of by the name of Lyndon Baines Johnson used his political astuteness and crossed very difficult lines. The Dixiecrats and others in the United States Congress who couldn't imagine supporting any manner of civil rights legislation. Isn't that a miracle? What we thought we could not do. And that president, who I owe such a great debt of gratitude, that master of the political process, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the creator of the Great Society, of which many of us now benefit from, Pell Grants and Medicare and housing, that person we call the president at that time orchestrated groups that possibly would never speak to each other and voted to change and move America forward. And so I ask the question, what makes President Obama differently? I cannot imagine coming this far in my life, that of my children's life, and that of others to come to a point where we would use the uniqueness and the difference of this president to treat him differently. If that is not getting in our way, then there is no reason why we cannot come together and solve this problem. As some would say, this is not rocket science. It is voting for the right approach. And that approach is revenue and cuts. I will go home to my district and engage with anyone who desires to engage in these discussions. We see each other as we walk about and go about our duties and give them the sense of optimism that I have. As I do that, I will be in a meeting discussing why the North Forest Independent School District 
one of the last re re remaining districts with a 70% plus African American population, has been closed by Governor Perry and the Texas Education Agency. Why? 7,000 students and parents now looking as to what is their next step. Why is it closed? Is it because you underfunded them and didn't provide them with the resources? Is it because we have uh, no interest in getting our hands into the mix and trying to help bring up the scores with teachers and salaries that can meet uh, the needs of students who are in a property poor area? I'll go home and deal with that. In the course of dealing with that, I'll talk to those parents about hope, about the greatness of this nation, and about the fact that we're going to do our job. And as well, I'll talk to them about the sense of pride and respect we have for the president that this nation elected that has come out of a history that I am very well aware of. We would hope that the same respect that was given to the first Irish Catholic president the same respect and interest that has been given from any president that brings to bear a unique and valuable perspective would be given to the President of the United States, the American President, our President. He is no different from any other president that has served. And I beg this House and I beg this Congress to treat him with the dignity that the office deserves. Get on with our work. Get on with solving the problems for the American people, a vastly diverse and richly multicultural nation. I am grateful for that. God bless this Congress. God bless this President. God bless the United States of America. We can do this job. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, is now recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. The gentleman is recognized for 60 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, one of the reasons I'm here today is, have you ever had one of those moments where you've been watching some television, you've been hearing some of your friends here on the floor, and um, the level of frustration starts to boil over, and you decide, look, I either need to get up behind that microphone and do a series of explanations of why I'm bouncing off of walls frustrated. And think about what we've heard just today. We had one member come down here, and meaning well and trying to find some way to tell his story, but treating the U.S. sovereign debt issue as a game. I heard the president today in a press conference once again throw out items like, well, those corporate jets. Well, we need to tax the rich more. And here's the problem. The math just doesn't work. So I thought, okay, I have these boards in the office that I use for a lot of other speeches. It's time to bring them here to the floor and walk through. And I'm sorry, I know I'm running two easels. I'm going to do this fairly quickly because I know I have some other friends of our conference that want to speak. But first, let's do the big picture. This is our world today. This is a dollar bill. Today, every dollar this federal government spends, 42 pennies of it are borrowed. Get that through your head. Every time we send out a check, every time we pay a vendor, that dollar that we pay that vendor, 42 pennies of it had to be borrowed. Once you understand that, a lot of the other rhetoric you hear around here is just bizarre, if not bordering on silly. So let's actually bounce on to the next. No, no. Let's bounce on to this next board. And this one here is just to sort of help understand how fast, how fast our numbers are eroding and why we need to do it now. 
This is not the day we come to the floor next week and vote for something. So let's just raise the debt ceiling and we'll all have an honest discussion next month about the scale of the debt. We'll have an honest discussion some other day about what we're going to cut. You've got to understand, every, what is it, 7.2 seconds, someone now turns 65. And the money that this body, I think, had the moral responsibility to set aside for those baby boomers is gone. And the most beautiful example I can give you of that is how many of you, when you think about it, have always heard from the politicians, oh, don't worry, Social Security is just fine. But didn't we just hear the president say, well, if we don't raise the debt ceiling, there might be a problem? Well, okay, which is it? Is Social Security just fine, or is it actually living on borrowed money? You can't have it both ways. Finally, I think the American people are waking up and understanding the scale of this debt and the crisis it brings us. So let's have a little interest here. Here we are in 2010. Here's we where we are in four budget years from now, 2016. Do you see this blue line? This is mandatory spending. It continues to grow and grow and grow. I'm told in about 13 and a half years, this blue line consumes every dime of federal spending. We are consumed by the mandatory spending. The entitlements consume everything we are as a people. But here's one of the rubs. If I look at even last year and this year, we don't take in enough revenue today to cover just the mandatory spending. So when you think about the, what we call discretionary, discretionary, military, EPA, all the other a alphabet agencies, all those exist on borrowed money. This is our world today. So we've been, I've been struggling and struggling trying to find a way to say, how do you help people understand the scale of these numbers? And then we came up with this idea We'll make a clock. Everyone knows how to read their clock, I hope. Of course, the problem is one of my, my staffers pointed out all the kids today were wearing digital watches, so I, but we're going to try it this way. How many of you repeatedly, whether it be today or the press conference a couple of weeks ago, have heard the president over and over and over and over say things like, those corporate jet owners need to step up and start participating more? Okay, fine. Let's say we all agree with that. How much does that actually buy us? Think about this. We borrow $4.7 billion every single day. This whole discussion over here where people, and we heard it just an hour ago from a member and the leadership on the minority saying, oh, corporate jets, you've got to be willing to give up those. Okay, let's say we do. What does it really buy us? Well, you'll be happy to know that we did the calculation to make it easy. It will buy you 15 seconds, 15 seconds of borrowing a day. Okay, work through this with me. There's what, 1,440 minutes in a day, you know, out of those 24 hours, and we're having discussions about things that are 15 seconds. This is absurd. So let's actually go on to some of the other really brilliant suggestions that seem to be coming out here. How many of you remember about six weeks ago the majority in the U.S. Senate held literally hearing after hearing about those subsidies to big oil and acted like, oh, if we get rid of these, they'll actually do something. We even heard it again an hour ago over here from the left, saying if we get rid of those subsidies, that's our first step into balancing this budget. So let's do the math, but let's actually do it my way. We wipe out the depletion allowance and all these other subsidies for not just big oil, but for all oil, it equals $2.44 billion a year. And just for a reference standpoint over there, I thought it would be fair for everyone to understand, those $2.44 billion that we call subsidies to big oil, there's $8.72 billion that goes to green energy. Brian, will you throw it? So, so understand the scale here. But well, let's just, right now, we're only going to fixate on fossil fuels. What does that really buy us? Well, I did it both ways for those people that like you know, charts, but those folks that like a clock. It buys you 2.2 minutes. So you see our little hand here? This whole discussion. And they act like it really does something. So we had the corporate jets at 15 seconds. Now this whole discussion about big oil and taking away those subsidies. It buys you 2.2 minutes of borrowing a day. Think of that. This is what 
around here holds up as honest debate? This is the honest proposals that this government is throwing out and letting the American people think we're actually talking about saying, well, if we raise the debt ceiling, we're going to go after these things and we'll get rid of those corporate jet subsidies and we'll get that big oil. And yes, we'll have almost gotten three minutes of borrowing cover today. It's absurd. So let's actually bounce on to one of the other bits of discussion that bounce around here. How many of you, and we actually just heard it a little while ago, those tax cuts? Do you remember those Bush tax cut extensions, which actually now are the Obama Bush tax cut extensions because the president signed them back in December under the lame duck session, if we all remember that. And we hear the discussion, we need to take those tax cuts away from those millionaires and billionaires. That will balance this budget. Does anyone out there actually pull out their calculator and do math? So I thought, why don't we make a clock out of it? We'll make a slide out of it so we understand reality. If you remove the tax cut extensions for everyone, not just the millionaires and billionaires, let's just do everyone, because math was easier to do that way, it buys you a whopping 28 minutes of borrowing a day. Think of that. I've watched people walk up to this well of this house, stare into this audience, this august body, and act like it would solve the problem. How can this place be operating under math fantasy? 28 minutes, if you wipe out, and that's playing the assumption that it doesn't slow down the economy, doesn't raise up unemployment, and every dime actually comes in. But if we're willing to engage in that fantasy, because why not? The, obviously, the argument is fantasy. It takes care of 28 minutes of borrowing. So let's see, so far we've covered 15 seconds with the corporate jets and 2.2 minutes with going after all fossil fuels, and now we found another 28 minutes. 28 minutes of borrowing can be covered if we wiped out what we call the Bush tax extensions that are really important to economic growth, but we'll, we'll, we'll just give it and just also pretend every dime comes in. Are you starting to realize we're barely at a half an hour of borrowing a day. And these are the types of proposals we're getting from the left on what we should do. You start to realize, where's its basis in reality? So let's actually go for a big one. Let's actually hop on because, you know, I'm not a big fan of war. So I thought, hey, why don't we calculate the big kahuna? What would happen? What would happen if we took in all that money from those corporate jet subsidies and all that money from getting rid of anything that incentivizes fossil fuel exploration and we also get rid of those Bush tax cuts extensions and we're, we're willing to slow down the economy and assume that every dime comes in and we just didn't have any of the wars. We didn't have Libya. We didn't have Afghanistan. We didn't have Iraq. They just all magically went away tomorrow. Because we've had repeatedly members from the left stand up behind these microphones and tell us this would take care of the problem. We just wouldn't have that 1.6 trillion we're going to run in debt this year if we just didn't have these sorts of things. Once again, it's time to put some batteries in the calculator. If we pretend every dime of that all went straight to paying down the debt, it's three hours. It's three hours. And we've actually put these slides up on our website so people can actually download them and look at them. But I want to turn to my brothers and sisters on the left here and say, okay, if I assume everything you're saying equals three hours, do you have any honest solutions for the other 21 hours a day? Instead of some of the silly rhetoric that I hear our president walking out to microphones and throwing things out and acting like this is my solution to the American people. The American people need to understand the scale of this debt. And it is going to destroy us as a people. And for once, you're seeing your Congress, at least on our side, stand up, be tough enough and say, we're going to use this opportunity to save our kids and our grandkids and we're going to save this republic. Please, please. Learn the numbers, understand how devastating this is, and it's time for the fantasy, the fantasy to come to an end and start dealing with real math. Mr. Speaker, I yield back my time. Gentleman yields back. The House will stand at ease.
Iowa needs to continue yes. to control the remainder of it. You got it. The gentleman from Iowa will control the remainder of the hour. The gentleman's recognized for the balance of the hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's my privilege to um, be recognized here on the floor of the House of Representatives and be able to address you on the about the matters of the day and the important issues that are before us here in this Congress and in this nation. And uh, yet I'm continually impressed by the quality of the young people that are attracted to this city, both as visitors, vacationers, uh, but also from uh, people that will get their college degree or degrees and many of them with a 4.0 grade point average, active in all kinds of extracurriculars, the, the stellar cream of the American crop are magnetized to come to this city. I'm impressed with them, their intelligence, their patriotism, their dedication on both sides of the aisle, Mr. Speaker. And, but I want to add something that is a perspective that I think uh, those of us that have uh, been around this planet a little bit longer have to offer, and that is, first, that some of us have lived a lot of history that others had to learn by reading the history book, and we know how the history books have been truncated. And there's not time to learn all the things that happen in history. Some of us learned a lot of history from the front page, from the radio, from the television, from the news, or from being in the middle of that history. And that all is part of the collective memory of this House of Representatives and the Senate on the other side. Some will say they probably remember more history in the Senate than we do here in the House. But, Mr. Speaker, my point to this is, is this, that you can have very smart people with very good principles, and the experience of their life are supportive of them understanding the underpinnings of the greatness of this country, understanding the pillars of American exceptionalism. But sometimes the definitions, and as it's presented, is taken at face value because they might not have had the years to see things go wrong when good ideas come before this Congress. And I look back and think of the time in 1995, actually 1994, when Republicans took over the majority in the House of Representatives here, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of being in the minority and not being able to advance legislation. There were many here in the, on the Republican side of the aisle that were complacent with that, Mr. Speaker, that accepted the idea that the majority would maybe never change in their lifetime and they operated within the zone that had been delivered to them and they didn't go and um, charge the ramparts or the windmill, so to speak, because the ramparts to them were windmills. Yet there were others that were revolutionaries that saw the vision, that realized that America was going the wrong direction. And they built a coalition here in the House of Representatives that I watched on C-SPAN night after night after night, step down here on this floor at this very spot, Mr. Speaker, and make arguments to the American people, make arguments to me that moved me, moved me in my head and moved me in my heart and helped me understand that it wasn't me alone uh, that was seeing that America was going the wrong direction, that we were overspending and we, we had this massive welfare system and that we were expanding the dependency class in America. This, this spirited people that we are, this unique people that we are here in America, were being diminished. We're being diminished by the, the growth of the nanny state and the growth of the dependency class in America. So in 1994, the, the inspiration came from many people that were hearing the inspiring words that, that were spoken into this very microphone, Mr. Speaker, but also across the country, on talk radio, across the backyard fence, over a cup of coffee, at work, at church, at school, at play, at recreation, in fishing boats and golf carts across America. We had a national conversation about where America needed to go. And the result of that consensus of the national conversation was a massive change in the seats here in the House of Representatives and a new majority in the House of Representatives that came sweeping in in November of 1994. And there were big changes. And the freshman class that came in and was sworn in here on this floor in January of 1995 were revolutionaries. And they brought a difference. And they forced a balanced budget here in the House that was not expected to ever be reached. They forced, they cut spending until they forced a balanced budget. And they reduced welfare and put more people in a position where they could earn their dignity and a paycheck at the same time. Now, 
as this unfolded, they brought forth, as they said they would in the contract with America, that they would vote on a constitutional amendment to produce a balanced budget. That was the 1994 promise that was fulfilled in 1995. A vote on a balanced budget amendment here in the House of Representatives that passed the House of Representatives was messaged right directly down the hallway to the United States Senate, Mr. Speaker, where the Senate took up the vote for the constitutional amendment to balance the budget, and it failed in the Senate in 1995 by a single vote. How different... How different might it have been, Mr. Speaker, if one more Senate seat had gone the other way, if one more United States Senate race had resulted in a victory for someone who believed in a balanced budget amendment, who believed in the Constitution itself, fiscal responsibility, those American exceptionalism principles that I have briefly mentioned, but believed in requiring a balanced budget constitutionally. How different it might have, might have been if the Senate had voted with the two-thirds majority as the House did in 1995 and had, had sent a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget to the states, the 50 states, for ratification. Now, we know, Mr. Speaker, it takes three-quarters of the states to ratify an amendment to the Constitution before it becomes incorporated into our Constitution. We'll never know how many states would have ratified that amendment because they didn't get the chance to do so. Had that been message to the, to the states in 1995, we can only ask the question, would the states have ratified a balanced budget amendment? I think so. I believe three-quarters of the states at a minimum would have done so. And if they did not, I think it would have changed the politics within enough of the states so that they would have. Imagine if this Congress here and now, today, this week, this month, would pass a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution out of this House with a better than two-thirds majority, equal or better than, to the Senate where they need 67 votes in the Senate. If that constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget gets messaged to the state, some will say, look at the makeup of the state legislatures. There aren't, there aren't enough, put it this way, Mr. Speaker, enough Republican majorities to pass and ratify a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget. Maybe not, and not by an, an analytical judgment of this moment, Mr. Speaker. But think what happens in a state like my neighboring state of Illinois, for example, where Democrats control the politics, and they insist on deficit spending and running themselves into the red. It seems as though the right of passage in Illinois is if you're elected governor, you go off to prison. But if we have a balanced budget amendment sitting on the docket of the Illinois state legislature, Today, I don't think there's much of any chance that they would ratify an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to do such a thing. But I do think, Mr. Speaker, that there will be hundreds of people all across Illinois that will decide they want to step up and run for public office so that they can have the chance to vote to ratify a balanced budget to the United States Constitution in the state legislature. They would go out and campaign, and they would knock doors, and they would talk to their friends and neighbors and say, I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if, uh, if you have some other interest. The best interest you can have is the long-term best interest of the United States of America. And it's become increasingly clear that the long-term best interest of the United States of America is to require that the budget be balanced by Constitution because this Congress has not demonstrated, and the President clearly has not demonstrated, that they have enough discipline to crank this spending down to balance the budget. Part of the reason is we have elections every two years in the House and every six years in the Senate. And so the, the incentive is be in a position to keep your job in two years or six years. There's not an incentive out there that tells the members of the House and Senate that we should prepare the groundwork for our grandchildren, let alone children yet to be born. That's part of the dynamics. The other part of the da dynamics are that this capital is full of bright, energetic people. A lot of them come to my office on a regular basis. A lot of them are honorable people with good intentions, but a lot of them are there because they want the tax dollars of the American people to go to their interest. And because there's a constant drumbeat of asks for more and more and more spending and the push for, well, I know that you're fiscally responsible and you want to balance the budget, but can you just make this exception because it's so important? 
it's so important that um, issue after issue, you'd be accused of voting against children and women and seniors and minorities and handicapped and combat wounded veterans all together if we do anything other than increase the budget to the level that's, that's um, hoped for and predicted by the President of the United States. So when I stand up for fiscal responsibility, Mr. Speaker, I often get this statement which is, well, you're a Republican, you Republicans spent too much money, and that's, you have to admit that you're half the problem. Well, no, I don't, Mr. Speaker. First, I voted against a lot of that spending. I've been an original co-sponsor of the balanced budget amendment offered by Congressman Bob Goodlatte of Virginia since I arrived in this town. And I'm sticking with him and the principles that are that constitutional amendment that we pass out of the Judiciary Committee that hangs on the calendar of the House today. But aside from that, speaking from a party-by-party -party standpoint, the truth is this. Yes, Republicans spent too much money, and in the middle of the Iraq War, we came within $160 billion of balancing the budget. Now, that's not particularly impressive if you dial it back a generation or two or three, but it's very impressive when you think of it in terms of the president's budget, which is a $1.65 trillion deficit in a single year. So actual real numbers come down to we came within $160 billion of balancing the budget in the height, at the height of the Iraq war. If it had not been for the Iraq war, we would have balanced the budget. If the equation is there, it's that simple. But the president has proposed a deficit, annual deficit spending budget of $1.65 trillion. Now, I've said the, middle, the, the deficit of Republicans is $160 billion. The president's deficit is $1.65 trillion. And on his deficit, Mr. Speaker, I'm not saying that this is a 10-year accumulated deficit. This is one year. One year, $1.65 trillion. Now, yes, Republicans spent too much money. But for every dollar that they went into deficit, the president proposes $10 of deficit spending into the same equation. I can't see that that's a shared responsibility. It looks to me like it's 10 times the overspending on the part of the president versus one-tenth of that on the part of the, the Republican Congress here in the middle of the Iraq war. Those are the facts as they are established by the Congressional Budget Office. We need to stand on facts here, not emote on emotions. And we need a level now of fiscal austerity. Mr. Speaker, we need to get to this point where we can send another balanced budget across to the United States Senate and ask them to pass it with a two-thirds majority and message it to the states. Give the states the chance to ratify it this time. If they had the chance to ratify the balanced budget amendment in 1995, I might or might not be standing here. I might have realized that, listen, government did its job, and I can go ahead and raise my family and run my business and live the American dream. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen, and some of us, out of frustration, stood up and engaged in public service and public life, and were elected to positions in perhaps our state legislatures and then came on here to this Congress. I have seen this country going in the right direction. I've seen this country going in the wrong direction. I've seen the spirit of America be diminished. I mean, we do as, you know, how many people in America today remember Jimmy Carter's Malay's speech, where he essentially said to us, you have to lower your aspirations. Yes, you are Americans, but it means something different in, in the future than it has in the past. That America is no longer going to be a country with unlimited resources and prosperity and aspirations and, and realized dreams. But that we have to wear a sweater and turn the thermostat down and drive at 55 and be limited by government. We have some of that going on now. We have the nanny state being reestablished under this administration. Now, I'd suggest that there are a number of ways to illustrate that, Mr. Speaker, but... I'd point it out this way, that the uh, food retailers sat down along with a couple of other interests, and this is something driven by the First Lady, I believe, and they have identified that about 30% of the kids in America are obese. And you may have seen in the news this week about some effort 
to go in and remove obese children from the families from their parents because obese parents are a bad influence on the diets of their kids and kids that are overweight are a health risk and they're more likely to have diabetes. Statistically, that's true. Mr. Speaker, I don't need a nanny state that's going to go in and weigh my kids and weigh me and my wife or my sons and daughters-in-law and grandchildren and decide whether I'm going to be able to manage my own children's life. I need the nanny state out of my life, not in my life, Mr. Speaker. I don't need them deciding what my diet's going to be. But this initiative that flows from the First Lady about, is about cutting 1.5 trillion calories from the diets of young people. Because I guess that you run them across the scales and do an average and do the calculus that 3,550 extra calories over what you're burning amounts to a pound. And then they can do the math and figure out if they can reduce 1.5 trillion calories from all the right places, these kids are going to lose weight in all the right places. Um, it doesn't work that way. I said, how are you going to do this? I asked them. They said, well, you know, we're going to reduce the number of calories in a bag of Doritos, for example. How do you do that? Take a couple chips out. Okay. What do we think a kid's going to do if he's hungry and a couple less chips in a bag of Doritos? He eats two bags. And then they said, well, we've got on the power bars that have 150 calories. We're going to reduce them down to 90. That way, you know, these kids are not going to gain weight. They'll lose weight because they're eating fewer calories in a power bar. So if you pick up a power bar and you're hungry, you're eating that because you want the energy. Your appetite calls for it. And there's only 90 calories in there. I'll suggest that these kids are going to eat two power bars and consume 180 calories rather than settle for 90 when before they were getting 150 out of that previous power bar. Kids are obese for two reasons. They have voracious appetites and they don't exercise enough. It's that simple. The former Secretary of Defense came out and said that 30% of our youth that are overweight is a national security risk because they're too overweight, they don't qualify for the military service, and therefore we can't recruit enough volunteers from the universe of people that are left that have a waistline that fits the standards for our military. And I would suggest that being obese does not destroy one's skeleton or muscular tissue or nervous tissue. It's just extra weight to carry around. And if it's a national security issue, then let's extend basic training and they can just stay there and do exercises and, and eat the diet in the mess hall until they make weight. This is not a national security issue. And I, I'm constantly hearing these arguments about national security. One of them is, well, national security is fresh fruits and vegetables. And if we don't have fresh tomatoes, it is a national security issue, so therefore we must have cheap labor to pick the tomatoes. Never mind the tomatoes have been bred now to be picked by machine. And I asked the question, Mr. Speaker, how long did the Eskimos get along without any fresh fruit or vegetables? They have lived for centuries on the high protein of the, of the animal meat that they can harvest up along the Arctic Circle. But they don't have carrots or broccoli or lettuce or tomatoes or pears or apples or peaches. None of that grows up there in the Arctic Circle. They are carnivores. And they've gotten along really well eating a meat diet because the nutrients are in there and they're concentrated. It's not a national security issue not to have guacamole, even though it's a profitable thing to raise the avocados. We get way out of balance here in this Congress and overemphasize things with all kinds of hyperbole, which brings me back around to where we need to go as a nation, Mr. Speaker. We need to go down this path of a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. And the president doesn't want a balanced budget, or he would have offered one. And the president wants to scare seniors. He did that on purpose because that's the statement that he made a couple of days ago when he said he can't guarantee if we hit the end of the debt, hit the debt ceiling limit, he can't dare guarantee that military pensions or Social Security would be paid on time. That was a calculated statement. It was calculated to scare the group of people who are the easiest to scare. That's our seniors. The reason they are is because they worked their whole lifetime to get into the position that they are in, and most of them are on a fixed income. That fixed income might be pension plan, other savings, Social Security, and whatever they might be getting from a, or a rent check or a, an investment of some kind. But when the federal government interferes with that, starts to send a message that they can't count on any component of it, yes, they get concerned, rightfully concerned. And 
this system that we have of entitlements cannot hold together if we continue down the same path that we are on. We have about 40 million people that qualify for Medicare today. In 10 more years, it'll be about 70 million people as the baby boomers come online. It isn't just that non-defense discretionary spending in this Congress is growing too fast. We can't solve the problem if we shut down the non-defense discretionary spending or if we ratchet it backwards. We must address entitlements. We also must guarantee to the seniors you've organized your lives around Medicare, in fact, Social Security, and we need to protect them in their interests. They des they're deserving of that. They may be getting greater benefits than they ever paid in, but they still have to be able to count on this Congress keeping its word. Meanwhile, a government that's spending itself into oblivion, however big a nation we are, there is no one to back us up. We don't get to go to the European Union and ask for a loan to bail us out. We don't even get to go to the Chinese or the Saudis to ask for a loan to bail us out. We are the last stopgap in Western civilization free enterprise world. And remember, there are a lot of entities outside that would like to see this country go down, tumble under, collapse to some degree. We don't have all friends around the world. And so we are the ones who have to hold the line. We don't get to go back for a backup of any kind. The Greeks could at least look to the European Union. And what did the European Union say? We'll loan you some money to bridge you through this problem, but you've got to cut your spending to our satisfaction before we'll loan the money. Now we have a president that says he can't guarantee that military pensions are going to be paid or that Social Security is going to be paid because he wants to use that as leverage to try to get a debt ceiling increase by making the least amount of concessions, and he'd like to make no concessions. That's the scenario that we're in. So I've introduced, along with Michelle Bachman and Louis Gohmert, with a growing number of co-sponsors today, an act called the Promises Act. And what it does is it requires that our military be paid first and on time every time, no exceptions, no hesitation, whether it is a spending gap that's a result of the expiration of a continuing resolution or whether we hit the debt ceiling the revenues in the United States Treasury, and there will be plenty there for this under all circumstances that we can envision, go first to pay the military. They're our number one line of defense. Their lives are on the line. They should never have to wonder in a foxhole or on a ship or in the air or their families near the barracks or at home should ever have to wonder whether that paycheck is going to be electronically transferred into their bank account on time every time. That's our guarantee with the Promises Act. And the military should never be used as a pawn in a political discussion here on the floor of the House of Representatives. Second thing is, we need, to, we need to take care of the full faith and credit of the United States government. That means we have to pay the interest and the necessary principal on our debt. We can do that with incoming revenues. And those who say we can't are wrong. And I don't care what their title is. We have $200 billion in anticipated revenue per month. It takes $11 billion to pay our military, and it takes $20 billion to service our debt. That's $31 billion out of $200 billion average revenue stream. That turns out to be, and I know, Mr. Speaker, you've calculated this in your head, 15.2% of the overall spending, of the revenue stream per month, 15.2%. That means pay the military first, service our debt second, guarantee the full faith and credit of the United States of America, and there's still plenty of money in that funding stream left over to pay Social Security, pay Medicare, go on down the line, pay military pensions. Keep faith with those who have stood on the line for America and keep faith with our senior citizens. And it takes the leverage out of the hands of the president. That's what the Promises Act is about. And some will say, well, no, you can't. The money's not there. Tell me where that money is then. $200 billion a month, $11 billion to pay our military, $20 billion to service our debt. It costs, um, here's the number, $58 billion per month uh, for Social Security. And for Medicare, it is $43 billion per month. We can even add defense on there, and we're getting up to the limit. I mean, all defense, not just the military pay. So, you know, as you can see, Mr. Speaker, we have lots of options. I want to take the options off the table for the president. I don't want him to be scaring our seniors. 
I want that guarantee to be there, but I go just far enough in the Promises Act that we take care of the absolutely necessaries, and I'm open to the discussion on how we might add other priorities behind them. First priority, pay our troops first. Second priority, pay the interest in the principal, the service of national debt. And as we move forward with this, the brinksmanship gets more and more intense, and as the President of the United States is looking to try to get us to crack, we need to understand that decisions will be made on August 2nd. The President alone holds the most power to decide who gets paid and who does not. I saw a presentation this morning that proposed that unemployment benefits get paid, but our military not get paid. Now, if that's something that's going to be proposed out of the White House and not just a hypothetical scenario, I think everybody in this country knows about the inequity of that. We would pay people not to work, but not pay the people that put their lives on the line for us. Is that an option open to the president today? That threat is already out there drifting through the stratosphere, or I should say cyberspace, and discussions, serious discussions about our priorities. This Congress can pass priorities, and absent statutory language that requires the executive branch to pay our bills in a priority order, he has the discretion to pay them in any order, or maybe just let them go in no order and see what happens out of a grab bag. He could sit in the Oval Office and toss a coin or throw darts at a dartboard and decide who gets paid and who doesn't right now. I'm calling upon this Congress, pass the Promises Act, or pass another priority pay the bills act so that we keep faith with our military, we keep faith with our international creditors, and we keep faith with our senior citizens. And furthermore, when I hear the language that says pay the military first and pay the national debt second, that means pay the Chinese first when you're servicing the national debt. If we borrowed the money from the Chinese, we have to pay the money back to the Chinese unless they sell our debt to somebody else. That's the facts. And if we didn't intend to pay them back, we shouldn't have borrowed the money in the first place. But if we're concerned about servicing 100% of our debt because the Chinese hold a trillion dollars of it, they hold less than 10% of our debt. So when we put $10 out to service our debt, one of those $10, less than one of those $10, goes to the Chinese. Half of those dollars go to Americans that hold U.S. debt, and some of that goes to the Saudis and, of course, other countries around the world. But this isn't pay the Chinese first. This is keep faith, keep the full faith and credit of the United States government first, keep faith with our military. We owe them more than we owe even our creditors. But I went through some of these things during the 80s, the farm crisis years of the 80s, that added clarity to it. And 3,000 banks were closed during that decade in the United States. A good number of banks around my neighborhood, including Mind Bank, was closed. And I remember when it happened. It was April 26, 1985, Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, when the FDIC showed up at my bank, put a red tag, a red sheet notice on the door, taped it on there, and two highway patrolmen stood at attention on either side of that door to guard the bank. And at that instant, they froze every single account, including mine. I had payroll to meet. My customers' accounts were frozen along with mine. We had to go to a barter system to keep the business running right in the middle of corn planting in Iowa. You could not have picked a worse date or time than they did on that Friday afternoon. But Mr. Speaker, I learned what was important. The first thing was we did go to a barter system, and I loaded and hauled hay to the auction to turn that into cash so I could pay my employees. They were first. I fed myself last. I paid the interest second, the necessary principal third. I kept full faith and credit with my creditors. But the first thing that the people that were on the line every day making the business run were like our troops are today. Without them, everything stops. And you live in fear. You don't have anything going. Pay them first, those people on the front line first. Pay the interest second. Keep your credit. Pay the necessary principal third. Then you can look around and maybe make some tough decisions and options. That's where this country is today. I do believe we must balance this budget, and I believe we must pass a constitutional amendment for a balanced budget. And I believe the American people will support such an endeavor, and if we don't have the votes to pass a constitutional amendment to balance the budget among the states, 
then the people in America will rise up and elect their state representatives and their state senators to go to their state houses and ratify the constitutional amendment to balance the budget. The American people want this. This is a national movement. Some of this is coming out of the Tea Party. The constitutional conservatives with the cause are activated. They stood up against Obamacare, and they'll stand up to balance this budget. And they will still stand up against Obamacare. And let me add to this, Mr. Speaker, that for this Congress to think about going down a path that would offer a balanced budget to the states in exchange for, let's say, um, some cuts in spending, increasing the debt ceiling by $2.4 trillion and cutting our spending and as a percentage of GDP, ratcheting it down to 19.999%, which is short of the constitutional amendments cap, for this Congress to do this but still allow what we will know as $105.5 billion to go forward to implement and enforce Obamacare is irresponsible. There are $23.6 billion sitting there right now, automatically appropriated for these times, this year, for Kathleen Sebelius and others to implement Obamacare while the president delays the case that should be expedited before the Supreme Court that I believe will find Obamacare to be unconstitutional. It's already been rejected by the American people by margins of 60% or better. There are 87 freshmen in this House of Representatives, all of whom ran on repeal of Obamacare, all of whom voted to repeal Obamacare. Every Republican in the House of Representatives voted to repeal Obamacare, and every Republican in the United States Senate voted to repeal Obamacare. And it's unconstitutional, in my view, in four different areas of the Constitution. And the Supreme Court will eventually rule when the president can no longer delay the actions of the Supreme Court. And he's believing that he can implement components of this and we won't want to let it go if the court finds it unconstitutional. He's believing that since there is no severability clause in Obamacare, that somehow the Supreme Court will look at it, maybe find a component of it unconstitutional, but decide at their option not to throw it all out and recognize an unex a non-existent severability clause. And that would be, Mr. Speaker, for... Um, uh, that a severability clause, non-severability clause is this. It's either the clause that can be in the bill will say if any part is found unconstitutional, then a severability clause says if any part is found unconstitutional, then the other parts are, are still retained. If it's missing that clause, if any part is found unconstitutional, then all parts are then, are, are then not retained and essentially repealed. The language that I've introduced, the language that Michelle Bachman introduced and others, Connie Mack comes to mind, uh, with all Republicans voting for it, is this. It ends 40 words to repeal Obamacare, and it ends with these words, as if it had never been enacted, close quote. That's the language we must put on a president's desk who will sign it. In the meantime, to spend $23.6 billion to implement an unconstitutional piece of legislation that's 26 pages, 2,600 pages long, that kind of money in a period that must be a period of austerity is an absolute waste. We know it's a waste. And if we're at this point where we're going to cut down spending, we have to do it by cutting off the $2.6 trillion of outlays that are Obamacare. $23.6 billion of that are sitting now in the hands mostly of Kathleen Sebelius. And they are seeking to send the roots of Obamacare into our lives and expand the dependency in us so that we decide we can't get along without Obamacare. To give you an example, if I might inquire as to how much time I have left, Mr. Speaker.